Welcome everyone. <laughs> Today is our release party. Uh, I'm here with Martin. Hello. And Khalid, Rachel, hey, everybody. Matt, come, make some noise. Hello. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Release party. Oh, nice, nice. I'm dress without the hat. I, I think All I right. did that. Um, <laughs> welcome everyone. Um, no matter what, what channel you're currently watching, either .NET Foundation or our JetBrains TV channel, um, we would like to introduce you today to our new releases, the 2021.2 uh, release for Resharper and Rider. I think Martin can put up the slides. I, I can then, put up the slides, yes. And then we do a quick intro, what's going to happen. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's my screen, right? Okay, that's better. Um, and today, during this um, release party, we're going to show you a bunch of features. Um, I hope you will like what we're going to show. Um, but first things first, as always, uh, if you have any questions, you can you can ask right away in the chat window from uh, from YouTube, and we will try to address them as we go. Um, or at the end, depending on whether it fits or not, uh, we will see. And also, um, if you have to. Uh, if you have to pause for any reason, uh, feel free to do that. You can continue watching. Also, right afterwards, this will be online right away. Um, so don't worry that you that you might miss something. And yeah, I hope I hope you have fun. And uh, I would do the hosting for for the for the course of this webinar. And I think we're gonna start with Martin. Is that right? I think that is right. And I'll, I'll just go Martin. for the shock effect in one go. Martin with um, VS 2022 preview. Let me see. Can I bring up your screen? Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to go with a shock effect, but now you kind of spoiled the surprise there. But yeah, let, let's go with it. <laughs> so um, as you can see, I'm running Resharper. Uh, it's a preview version in Visual Studio 2022. Uh, it's, it's not an official stable release yet. But if you want to give it a try uh, in Visual Studio 2022, you can actually do so. I like living on the edge, so I will be doing a lot of the demos here in Resharper on VS 2022 and the preview of Resharper. If you try it, keep in mind it's a preview. Uh, and also keep in mind it's an out-of-band release, so it's not yet in Toolbox. It's not yet in the auto-updating mechanism and so on. So I would say bookmark this URL. Keep it handy, and every 30 days, I think you will have to go there and download it again and get an update to keep it working in the latest version of, uh, of the Visual Studio 2022 preview. So um, with that, I think I can start showing features because everything you will Martin. see. Yeah, Martin, yeah I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to interrupt straight away. It's like, what's so important about VS 2022? Well, so the the interesting thing with VS 2022 is that it's 64 bits which means that there's just more memory for Visual Studio to use, but also more memory for ReSharper to use. And actually, let me start my task manager here. You will see I have three Visual Studio versions running. Um, actually, I can only see one. Yeah, there's, there they are. One is very low on memory right now, so that, that's a nice one. It's swapping out things and not really using a lot of things. But you'll see the more I start using things, the more features I enable in Visual Studio and so on, you will see more memory is required. But because it's 64 bits, there's no real garbage collection involved all the time. And Visual Studio and ReSharper can essentially go wild on your machine, which you may like or may not like, but it's, it's really good. So finally, all those people with big, beefy machines can uh, make use of the memory that's there. Yeah, exactly. In, in Visual Studio 2019, for example, you have 32 bits. So even if you have a 64 gig machine with uh, with 24 cores or something like that, those cores can actually be used, but the memory cannot be used by that 32-bit process. And now it can, which is nice. I, th I think the highest that I've seen was yesterday was someone having 22 <coughs> gigabyte, I think, of memory. <coughs> yeah, it's not a competition. 24 or something, yeah. It, it, it's not a competition. We're not trying to get to use the most as uh, memory. <laughs> Well, still, still, it's nice to have it. Anyway, let's uh, let's let's dive in. So um, the preview has all the features from 2021.2. Um, so regardless if you are using this preview version in VS 2022, or you are making use of the current stable version in VS 2019, it will all work and it will all be very similar. And I hope because I'm using a preview that we don't expect 
or don't see anything that is uh, that is not expected. So let's uh, let's start with nullable reference types in Visual Studio uh, and ReSharper. Um, I'm not sure if everyone here has been using them before. Who has? Raise your hand. Well, all of you, except yeah, may maybe some people who are not watching. So I'll give you a really quick introduction to what they are. Uh, so the idea is this is regular C-sharp without nullable reference types. And you can immediately, well, you cannot immediately see the fact that I have a very hidden bug that will only be visible at runtime in this case. I have a string that is null. I'm reversing the string. I was actually really smart in this method to do a null check and return null if nothing is passed in. Um, but then the next thing I'm doing is with that reverse string here, which can be null, I'm calling dot length. And at runtime, this will just blow up. You'll get a null reference exception, and things will break down. So the idea with nullable reference types is that you can enable them. And once you do so, you will see that ReSharper starts adding suggestions on many things. So for example, this string is not nullable, but we're passing it null, which is wrong. And ReSharper tells us, well, this is, this is not nullable. So you should probably be either suppressing this warning, making sure that we can essentially ignore the fact that this is null going into a non-nullable string or change the type and make it a string question mark, which is actually a nullable string in this case. I'll go with that and ReSharper will ask me to update everything that it knows in the path and in that code graph. It will just update all the code. So now all of a sudden, my reverse function takes a nullable string, it returns a nullable string. And you can also see immediately that this thing can actually be null. My sum reverse string can be null and I have to do something with that. And it essentially, before even running this, ReSharper and the compiler are able to catch whatever exception that I may have there. So I can either check this expression for null, which is nice, or I can add a nullable suppression warning, which is this exclamation mark essentially saying, look, I know better compiler, I know better ReSharper. Uh, this, even if it blows up, I'm fine with that. I'm consciously choosing to make this uh, null, null reference exception that might show up. Um, this is obviously not something that you always want to do. There are cases where you actually want to do this. And you will especially see this happening when you're migrating code bases to nullable reference types. I'm not sure if any, anyone here has actually tried updating an existing code base to use nullable reference types. But after a while, your entire code base is going to be littered with these exclamation marks, the dammit operator, or whatever it is called. Um, just essentially suppressing warnings until you figure out what the actual value is and whether it can be null or not. So um, let's actually show one of the new things because this was a really quick intro into nullable reference types. If you have a lot of those, of those suppressions in your codes, um, ReSharper actually lets you find those suppressions and lets you act on them and actually make your code base better by removing those suppressions if they are not needed. So here, I have a method called greetings. It's calling person say hello, person say hello. And my person here is returning a nullable person. Now, I don't really want this because I'm always passing an actual object there. So I can change this one. And um, first of all, of course, enable nullable annotations in this file. There we go. And then I can make this method return type not nullable, just return an actual person. And you will see all of a sudden by returning an actual person here that this exclamation mark has become grayed out because we no longer need it. And this is new in ReSharper 2021.2. You can actually ask ReSharper to remove this redundant suppression. And all of a sudden, you no longer have that balance or those, those, yeah, those operators that you actually don't need in codes. Even nicer is that you can also find nullable warning uh, suppressions in your entire code base. So let's find all of them in this solution. I think it's only going to be a couple, but you will see that ReSharper finds them and lets you walk through them and update your code as you go to, to actually re remove the stuff that you added beforehand while you were introducing nullability in, the, in your code base. Um, maybe you already saw it. When I was changing nullability, um, I used a refactoring. So I did an alt enter and then changed the return type there. Um, you can also do that on anything that you have in your code base. So um, for example, here I have an add employee methods that adds a person with a role. What I can do is uh, alt enter here and make this um, nullable. 
or I can use the refactor this method and say that I want to make this one nullable as well. Or I can just type question mark, alt enter and see that I have a nullability change there. New refactoring in resharper. Uh, just enter and resharper will suggest me to update the entire call tree again with whatever uh, accepts that nullable reference. So in this case, quite a number of occurrences. I can click next and all of a sudden my list here is now accepting nullable persons. All of these things are also accepting nullable persons. So it's, it's actually a really useful refactoring uh, where Resharper helps you figure out the entire tree and structure of your code base there. Um, for those of you who have been using Resharper for a long, long time, uh, you may know that um, before there used to be the Resharper or JetBrains annotations that you could use where you could annotate methods with can be null, item can be null, not null, etc to give Resharper some additional information. Now, of course, with C Sharp having these things uh, on board, you may not, you may no longer need them. And maybe you just want to update all of the usages there and make them compiler things. Well, Resharper now comes with a refactoring where you can say use type annotation syntax and will update this one here, for example, to return a nullable person. I can do I this was waiting for this for, for so long, like really. Yeah, yeah, and it was so tempting. Tempt it was so tempting converting that by, by yourself, but it's also really tedious, right? And having the ability to just go through one by one and, and apply that is really, really nice. Yeah. It, it's 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 actually nicer because like a lot of the inspections that you see in Resharper, you can also uh, update this in, for example, the entire solution or just in this file. I'll go with file now and you'll see that everything gets updated. Uh, this not null apparently is no longer needed, so I can also remove that, but now just two alt enters away and this entire code, even if it's only a couple of lines, has been updated to use the, the, the compiler syntax, which is quite nice. So, so you say I can update my whole solution in two or three, four keystrokes? Go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Really nice, really nice. Um, also, speaking of those annotations, I, I kind of showed it here. When you have those that are not needed, uh, you will see them grayed out, so Resharper can remove them for you. Um, the compiler under the hood in C Sharp is also making use of its own uh, annotations. So you will see that there's a not null in C Sharp proper as well. Uh, same thing there, Resharp will also discover that those things exist or do not exist, and I can remove those um, if I want to or if I have one where I have a nullable uh, thingy and I want to specify that this can actually be null, I can update between the shorthand syntax with the question mark or make use of the attributes that are there. Hey, Martin, I, I have a question yeah. for you. You know, um, for folks maybe who aren't familiar with nullability, uh, they're seeing you put that uh, processor directive uh, at the top of the file where you enable nullability. Um, but what are some of the other ways folks can kind of opt into nullability uh, in different ways? Because this is at the file level, but are there other? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Good, good question. Um, so nullability can be enabled for your entire project. Um, actually, if you go into the project file and you say uh, nullability, nullability, I think it's nullability, uh, you can specify enabled, and then all of a sudden everything in your project will have nullability enabled. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also make it disabled, where it will not be enabled for the entire project, and then you can start overriding for every single file. Uh, there's a couple of options per file, so imagine if you enable it, Maybe you are in a piece of code that you do not yet want to introduce nullability to. You can then per file do an overwrite and say, okay, in this one, I want to disable nullability. Um, so there's no context for the compiler to keep track of, but also you don't get those pesky warnings. Um, there's also um, yeah, enable, disable, or restore to essentially revert to the state you were in. Mm -hmm. The nice thing there, by the way, is that you can also do this um, for example, per line. So you could enable nullability for the entire file, but then at some point you want to say, okay, look for a name here. I want to disable nullability. And then afterwards enable it again. You can also do that and sort of mix and match on the bits of, of code where you mm -hmm. want to have those things. Yeah, we, we uh, actually- been pointed out. Yeah. Uh, I'll jump in. As been pointed out in the, uh, the comments there uh, by David, it's, um, there's a, it's nullable, not nullability yeah. there. Yeah. That's it. 
Thanks, David. The, the element you want there is, is nullable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, also, also, I think we should give a give a shout out to our one of our uh, developers, Andre Dyatlov, who's been writing a couple of blog posts on that. Um, and I I really recommend you to check some of those out, um, which go very uh, in uh, in depth uh, with the whole topic. I think there's also not even just enable disable. There's also annotations and all that stuff. Every time I forget, but this is like my yeah. go go to uh, mm -hmm. uh, source basically uh, for all those questions. And yeah, also because it uh, you know um, puts a highlight on on the reshuffle and rider tooling, etc. They are they're so they're fantastic blog posts. posts. They're, they're really good blog posts and really well worth uh, checking out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So so, Martin, uh, one last question for you in terms of nullability, uh, and this is kind of like a personal opinion, but like uh, when you're converting to use some of this stuff, obviously ReSharper uh, can help you out, but uh, what's the approach you would recommend for folks getting into nullability? So uh, it's actually one that I did. So um, we have another product, server-side product called Space. And for that one, I've been building the SDK since just before nullability was introduced somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so it was originally, well, the initial code was written without nullability uh, in mind. And gradually, I started adding nullability there. Um, and you will see that in a lot of places, you're just suppressing stuff because you do not yet know what something may be returning or not. So that's mm -hmm. really useful to actually start. Um, yeah, I really like the fact that you now have that fine nullable warning suppressions. So that's the first pass you make, you can actually suppress things. But the second pass is you can start removing those suppressions wherever they uh, wherever they don't make sense anymore, or where you have more information about about the nullability context that is available. So just take an incremental approach, maybe do it by yeah. file and. Uh, yeah. Actually, I think in this project there's probably a couple of places uh, where they are still disabled because um, I know the we're not using the latest .NET six, for example, or .NET five even for this one because we want to be compatible with uh, the long term service release of, uh, of .NET. So there are actually a couple of places, especially where we're using system.text.json, which does not yet fully support nullability in that version, where we actually have to disable them to be able to work with those libraries. Oh wow, that's a that's a really good edge case then to kind of let people know. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, nice side note there, by the way, is that in .NET 6, that's going to be completely no longer the case. Because in .NET 6, you will see that uh, I think the goal was to have 100% of all of the framework methods at least covered uh, with mm -hmm. nullability annotations. So that's definitely going to be a help there. Yeah. Let's get to .NET 6. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> ne next release party, I guess. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, let's ma let's maybe dive into the into the next topic unless uh, unless there's more questions coming in. No, uh, David Glass said he loves your uh, font ligatures. So uh, yeah, ligatures are awesome. Sweet. Yes, I, I told you you, sh you should enable them in. Uh, in <laughs> yeah. Also, the the font is JetBrains Mono. So uh, are you using JetBrains Mono there, or are you using Cascadia? I am using the default in Visual Studio, so this is not oh, JetBrains Cascadia. Mono. Yeah. Ice Cascadia, yeah. We, we, all, we all like JetBrains Mono for no apparent reason. It's uh, <laughs> totally unbiased. Yeah. By the way, does Jet, JetBrains Mono also run on .NET Core? Oh, <laughs> joke. I'm sorry. Bad joke. <laughs> Couldn't hold it. Bad joke. It's not JetBrains.NET Core. Mono. Oh, <laughs> Carry on, Martin. All right. Uh, let, let's maybe dive into source generators. Um, I'm still on the fence whether everyone is going to write their own source generators or not. But in the framework, at least, you see a lot of places where um, where Microsoft and other framework authors are using source generators to actually take your existing code and add code to your solution at compile and at design time so that it gets compiled and essentially take some of the boilerplate code away. So I'm not going to dive into writing a source generator. I'm just going to see how you can work with code that is being generated in, uh, in, uh, in ReSharper here. So what I have is uh, an employee class, very inspirational as an example, I know, um, where we have a source generator that using the auto notify attribute here, takes a field in the class and then generates a property with change notification for that one. I know we have a refactoring where you can alt enter and introduce those things into your code base. Uh, but here the idea is, define the fields, 
put auto notify on it and you will see that all of a sudden you also have a first name and a last name property that you can use in other methods and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to add, I, th I think it's important that I know a lot of C-sharp people probably don't use the partial keyword, um, but you've actually had to use it here. Um, like why is why why are you using the partial keyword in this case? Oh, really, really good question. So yeah. um, there's the employee class, uh, which is a partial, like you observed, um, which has a constructor, sets all the fields, and has a methods. But this first name and last name property have to go somewhere, and this is where uh, the source generator comes into play. What this auto notify attribute will do is tell that source generator to generate everything in the other parts of my employee class. Mm -hmm. So if I navigate using control click to this property, for example, we will end up in the generated sources and you will see that this one is also partial class employee and adding those things and making use of the different fields that I had in my original class. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess this is a good e example. The fact that source generators are additive, but they can't do like call site replacement, right? So we have to use these techniques and dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think a lot of people were confused at the beginning, especially at the beginning with source generators, that it would be something that could take your code and rewrite it. That's not the case. They only add stuff to your projects, uh, but they do not replace things. Yeah. A couple of techniques that you can use, I would again point to Andre's blog posts and presentation because he's doing some crazy things with source generators. Um, but that would, would take us too far, I think. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Martin. That's a great clarification. Thank cool. you. All right, while we are in generated source, so thank you for making the bridge there. Um, by the way, if you want to find out what generator is emitting which code, you can actually go into Visual Studio's dependencies here, go into analyzers, find generators, or find the source generator that you added. And then you can see that, for example, the auto notify property generator added the attribute itself, added my partial employee and added a person view model as well um, as examples in this, uh, in this bit of code. Cool, back to the generated source. Um, you may have noticed that we now have proper syntax highlighting in a generated source, but also proper navigation and so on. So if we want to navigate back to our human written code, I'll just call it that, I can actually control click there or use the navigation shortcuts. Um, What's also nice is that you get errors, or um, yeah, you can see whenever you have an error in there. If I change this one to first name X, for example, you will see that I have some errors of the code that is being generated. But also, while I'm making a change, let's, let's try to do this quickly. I'm too, too slow to actually make it happen. Anyway, if my first name, if the source generator would have an error or uh, would emit something that is wrong, it would actually also show the errors. Um, I'm not going to update the actual source generator to make it uh, emit something that is wrong, but you get the idea. You will see errors in a generated code as well. Um, actually, I think I can do a quick one. If I remove that partial there, you will see that I now get errors because it's no longer part of the same employee mm -hmm. class. Cool. Uh, let's undo that one and let's go with the one that is that 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 really blows my mind. Let's do a refactoring inside of the generated code. So again, I have an employee with a first name property and a last name or a first name and a last name fields that generates a property. If I go into the generated code, I can actually take that. Let's, let's take the last name property here and invoke the rename refactoring and make this, for example, just name instead of last name. If I update this one in my generated code, ReSharper is going to recognize that the last name property in the generated code came from the last name field in my human written code. We'll update it and we'll then re-invoke the source generator to update everything to be name and, and the name field and all, which I think blows my mind. You no longer have to find the generated code and then go back to the original class where you rename this thing and then invoke everything again. You just do it from within the generated code and Richard will figure it out and figure out what the flow is to actually generate those things. You're all so silent now. It, it has blown your mind. <laughs> yeah, we're broken now. This is not. Uh, <laughs> that one is very cool. Yeah, you know, it's uh, like uh, one of ReSharper's strengths for me has always been kind of diving into code and seeing things that maybe 
uh, folks don't want you to see. Uh, and I think this is kind of amazing that even in stuff that maybe you should kind of ignore or not look into, if you find yourself there, we still give you options to fix your code. Uh, so that it is, it is kind of amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I, I think originally when we estimated this segment of the release party, I said something like 12 minutes. We're at 26 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should have just had a uh, nullable reference type source generators release party. And yeah, uh... absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, let, let's maybe cover a couple of the, of the quick fixes and new inspections that are there. Um, I know a lot of people when you write, especially when you're doing something that is more low level where you have to swap uh, elements in an array, for example, there's a new uh, inspection that will tell you that you can also swap this using deconstruction and resharper will rewrite it to essentially have two, two pairs of tuples and, uh, and change those things. Uh, there's use empty inspections as well. Very often you want to start with an empty string array, for example. Um, that's good, but if you have lots of those, you will be allocating many empty string arrays. Uh, instead, what you can do is use array.empty of string, which will give you back the exact same array continuously throughout the lifetime of your code base. Hence, you will have fewer allocations, which will be better for your code base. So we added inspections for many of those occurrences where such types exist in .NET. Uh, even with event arguments, I think there's an empty one there as well. So you can just alt enter and update those um, as you go. Cool. Um, maybe one more while we are in ReSharper. Uh, and also because I want to make a bridge to uh, what Rachel is going to show, because we're all prepared and, uh, and, and all that. So uh, let's make that bridge is that um, if you have a web application, I think, I think Rachel is going to tell you more about this. If you have a web application and you are making use of the HTTP client and any methods that request something from that web application in your code base, you will now also get completion of all of the endpoints that are available in your code base. So for example, I can call uh, get random meal from my other project and get completion of that inside of a string. Even better, there's also navigation, so you can see if I hold the control key or I make use of the navigate uh, of the navigate uh, shortcuts, I can actually go there and dive directly into this get random meal API from the other project, which is uh, which is kind of cool. But oh, as I mentioned, yeah. I'll leave it to Rachel to dive into the details of this one. No more, no more typos with these, right? Yeah. <laughs> Magic strings. Um, yeah, Mar Martin said it already. Already, Rachel snacks with ASP.NET Core endpoints. Endpoints. Which I know nothing about, but I'm eager to learn. Oh, good. These are easy anyway. So, yes, the thing that everybody does. This is so handy. So we all have to work with APIs. Or almost all of us. If you're on the web, you're definitely working with an API. But even a lot of client apps. So what do you do to, you know, kind of get a nice overview of what do you have and what can you call and managing them and calling them and all of that? Well, that's where we have the endpoints window. Uh, so you could go to view tool windows and then endpoints and it'll pop up your endpoints window. And what writer does is it scans through looking for uh, certain types of patterns in the code to find endpoints for us. Uh, specifically, it looks at some of the attributes and things like that. So this is really, really handy. And I mount multiple projects in this solution. So of course, they're going to be in my API. Um, if I pick the other ones, no endpoints. That's okay. Uh, I would expect them to be in the API. But the really cool stuff I could do here is not just by sorting them and uh, managing how they look. I could do that, right? I could group them or view them a little differently, but I can actually click on one of these and I can take a look at some information about them. I get this little documentation tab, the uh, HTTP client tab and the open API tab. So this is kind of cool. I could bounce through here and see, oh, what's all the metadata about this particular endpoint? If I want to go and investigate in the code, I can just right click on it and do a find usages. Oh, this is the best too. It's searching, searching, takes it a minute sometimes, boom. Here it found all of the calls to that endpoint that is within my project. Now this is like the handiest thing ever. It's like sliced bread, better than sliced bread. So I'm still not sure why we use sliced bread as any kind of measuring 
you know, like why are things better than that? But you when we sent somebody to the good. moon, so I, I, I mean, it's really good, but we sent somebody to the moon. Can't we measure, you know, that? I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, I just double click on any of these. Boom. It's right here, right in your editor. So this is like the super handiest navigation ever. I love this. I just live in the endpoints window. It's so, it's so fun. Um, if I need to do stuff like uh, YAML, because everybody likes YAML, right? 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 Yes, I love it. <laughs> no sure, one loves YAML so much. YAML loves is it. awful and great. Uh, it is, it is awful. Don't get it? me started, it's supposed to be a party. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, we're supposed, we're supposed to be up here. Yay, YAML is awesome. Um, so here I can actually come in, select any ones that I want. I just grab them all here with a control A. Go to my open API tab. And if I click this little save icon, I could export this to YAML. So you don't have to worry about handcrafting it because that actually would really suck. Uh, but here it just makes me a nice little YAML file that I can then save. And if I wanted to, uh, this is not my actual URL, but I can change this really quick for testing. Um, and give it a little refresh up in here. And there we go. So now it's changed it. I could come in here and you could see it does a little swagger thing. Like a little bit of a scroll there. And click execute and goes through, actually calls the API. Uh, now you do have to have that running. And I did have this running before I uh, started here, but so you do have to have something running, but you can do this with not just endpoints in your project, but endpoint repositories and uh, other locations for endpoints. So here I get a whole bunch of my little categories for this meal planning app. And here I did not have to write a whole bunch of YAML, which is I'm all about not having to write a whole bunch of YAML. I think most of us are. Um, JSON's fine. YAML just for some reason just doesn't seem to quite work the same way. Uh, but here I can just save it. I could go and manage a lot of things in here. I could also run right out of here as well. If I go back to this little HTTP client tab, uh, the same thing, I may need to modify this a little bit. And then once I do that, uh, I could just click run. So you notice this is kind of a theme in Rider. Um, I could click run on anywhere I see these little arrows. And I think I typed in the wrong address there. And wherever I do it, will submit a request, and then I may get something back, right? Depending on uh, what you it just, is. You just forgot the S on the HTTPS uh, part. No, oh, that's what it was. Well, yeah, so I did type it in wrong as usual, right? There we go. So, yeah, so I, now I, I can see the results in here. It's really good. I love this. It's really, really nice web tooling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what's cool too is um, sometimes with open API specs, and especially the endpoints tool, you can kind of share those open API YAML files, even in a non web yeah. uh, scenario, like in a console application. Right. So uh, yeah, the endpoints tool will just light up uh, if it finds a open API YAML file in your project and it will find those endpoints, which is, it's one of my new favorite features. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, this is totally great. Uh, so also, if you just noticed these little uh, like open API icons in the gutter, if I click on them, it will open an HTTP file, which is writers HTTP client. And then the same thing from here, it's an alternative way to be able to run these. All right, so I could just run them in a slightly different um, tool window, right? But it all ends up being the same kind of stuff. But I like to have an HTTP file around with a bunch of little endpoints defined in it. And you can even add more to this, like your body or uh, request headers, things like that, and send the data over and get some data back and stuff like that. So uh, quite That's nice. Cool. And I, yes, again, I would need to change these in this case, I picked the wrong one, but um, really nice management tools here. So so Rachel, I was actually wondering because you have the the endpoints tool window at the bottom, but if you are in the Open API document itself in, inside of the the YAML codes, can you also navigate to your API from from the YAML? To the Open API from Let's, the YAML. Uh, yeah, maybe? So imagine going to one of the APIs that are defined in there. Um, 
I have I've no idea, just, just asking. Oh, do you mean uh, something like this, or no, do you mean going right to the code? No, API slash course or something. Again, I have no idea if it works, but just wondering. Wait, so I didn't hear what you said there. Oh, yeah, so yeah, there. Uh, yeah. So control click on that one. Oh, the control click. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so here uh, I get a little bit of extra. There's always something popping up in Rider for us, right? So here I can actually see this URL path segment and where some of this is and some calls to it as well. So that's kind of cool. So if I that do nice. maybe the post, then it'll take me to at least one of the calls to it. Uh, yeah, you do. I forgot about the control clicks right out of here too. <laughs> There's so much stuff. Um, but I could go right to the to the calling code from that. And then uh, from there, of course, you can go right to the endpoints right out of the calling code, right? So the same thing, a control click. So there's really nice navigation between these tools and the editor. Yeah. Uh, I think the other thing I had to talk about was actually to switch over to Visual Studio. I know we're having like so much fun in right. Rider. Now we'll go over to Visual Studio, but um, that's because we have some of the um, attributes for routing in ReSharper. Uh, for example, like a refactoring, if I come in here and I have a action result and I just go to do a refactoring and I wanna rename it, uh, here I could do my alt enter and it'll apply rename factoring. Um, but you might expect it just to do it in the method. Sure it does, but it also picks it up in those attributes and anywhere else that that might be used. Uh, there's also structural navigation. So if my cursor lands before a um, double quote, then I can use the tab and do tab, tab, and you can see it's selecting little bits. Uh, here I'm structurally going through that action and then the actual word tag in it and then the next whole block and then the word tag in it and then structurally navigating through the actual method as well. So that's some of the newer things in the uh, last release that we've had. That's also very nice. If you're again, working in the web, you're working with endpoints. This is where you live and breathe all day. So between endpoints and this works ReSharper, it works in Rider, just the same. Um, so if you have Rider, then you're doing endpoints. You get to come here and structurally navigate through um, the nice uh, different ways of doing it with the uh, writer or resharper to go through your um, endpoints, navigate back and forth, do all this cool stuff that you need to do every day since we're living in there. Uh, so I think that was all that I had. Uh, just showing a little bit of writer and resharper endpoints and uh, attributes on the routes, things like that. So who is next? Well, we, we actually have a question. Uh, Sorbond asked, um, you know, what kind of endpoints actually get discovered? And he's asking specifically about gRPC. Um, do, does anybody have any, like, um, ideas about whether we'll support gRPC endpoints uh, in the endpoints window? I didn't hear anything about it, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to do it. So for right now, it's just these kind of uh, regular like mm -hmm. REST endpoints or other stuff that has attributes on it, stuff like that. Yeah. But gRPC is becoming pretty popular, right? So I, I think this is also a great else? moment to, uh, to, to plug our public issue tracker where you can just do feature requests and then have other people yeah. vote on it and add comments and things like that. So that's uh, utrack.jetbrains.com. Yeah. Now I've, I've talked to the folks working on the endpoints and there's gonna be a lot of work, especially when we start getting into .NET 6 with minimal APIs and stuff like that. So um, there will be the limitation that Rider always works on the code that you write. Uh, so if you have any kind of dynamic routes being generated at runtime, uh, those are probably gonna be a little bit more difficult to discover. Uh, but there, there's always going to be the workaround of if you generate your open API specs and put them on disk, the endpoints tool will find those endpoints. So uh, that's always a, an option as well. So, yeah. All right. I think next up is uh, debugging again with, with Rachel. Rachel, but if you need ah, a again. moment, then we can also take Matt first. No, that's fine. Uh, so laser, <laughs> laser debugging. Uh, so there's a couple things I could do to show for debugging. 
So uh, debugging, of course, we know that Writer has some really great debugging tools. If Writer will stop. So launch Writer while you stop another running instance of Writer. There we go. So a pretty common setup is you might have, you know, client. Uh, here I have like a client app, a shared library. This is Blazor, a shared library and an API. And uh, until we had the Blazor debugging, you could step through the API like you would expect, like regular old debugging, all of your, you know, step in, step out, run to breakpoint, et cetera. You get all the goodies in there. But then when it came to the client, you would have to go into dev tools and do a lot of work in the dev tools. Uh, but now we don't need to do that so much because uh, we have Blazor client side debugging. So I could come to any page that I want. And here I have a mix of both Razor, .razor pages for uh, Blazor and also Razor.cs as well. So depending on how you model your um, apps, you might have just .razor or .razor.cs uh, or a little mix of both. For some of the smaller pages that are just utilities, I don't have the, um, I tend to call it a code behind. I know it's not a code behind, but that associated uh, Razor page. So I could come in and put a breakpoint in here, basically anywhere. Not a lot of code in this one, but that's okay. I just hit F9, there I have myself a breakpoint. And you'd probably expect this would be the first thing you would think that it can do. But also, if I come into the dot razor page, uh, wherever there is some code, right, that's not just HTML, you can put a breakpoint there as well. And then in addition, I could put breakpoints on um, the back end too. So, you know, I could step through the API and the front end. So I could put them anywhere. It really just does not matter. Now, before I run off to run this, if we're going to um, start debugging and we have to work with the runtime versions of these apps, what I want to do is make sure that I have a particular edit configuration or something that can do this. Uh, I just have a compound configuration that I set up. And this is not a new feature. We've been able to do this in Rider for a while, but you'll want to have this. Uh, a compound configuration that runs your API, then runs your app. It makes things a lot simpler. Uh, later, there's gonna be some multiple startup projects and things like that, but this works just fine. It launches your API, then launches the app. Alternatively, you could launch the API yourself in debugger run mode and then launch the app yourself. Uh, I find it easier just to say, you know, have this little run all and then have it run, run them both at once. So I could do that with debugging as well. So when I do debugging, uh, the same thing in that edit configurations, I get to choose if I want a browser to launch. So as soon as this does launch, then I could go back in there and, and show this. Uh, of course, it does have to load up a lot of stuff to be able to launch debugging and it has to launch the actual app itself. And I think I have mine set to Chrome, so it should pop up a whole separate window. And I just made it do a whole bunch of work here. So it's taking a second or so, but we could see it had to go through the build, did some things. You'd see it's starting to talk to Chrome here. Here we go. So that first time, if you haven't debugged in a while, might take a bit. And here we go. It actually hit a big point already and right here, right? So I could keep running. Actually, let's click over to debug. It's still doing a few things. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, now where did I actually, I thought that hit the breakpoint. It actually didn't hit the breakpoint. Um, what I wanted to do is in the a list of meals for a meal planning app, if I click here, gives me that little nothing to see while it goes off and does some blazery things. And I'm getting a, a different error here. Let's try it. I think this is the curse of screen sharing because you can uh, actually, yeah you can see it processing the assemblies in Rider in the background. It's just because you're screen sharing, it's just taking a while. Yeah, I think it's just the lag with it taking up all the resources from the screen sharing. Then what happens is sometimes it'll launch 
and sometimes like this just look the way that blazer loads right sometimes it's loading up some things before it shouldn't before it loads other things oh i have to click on it a couple times oh there we go i think it actually did yeah here we go it actually did so it did finally load stuff up yeah so the curse of screen sharing and lag from you know not having the best laptop on the planet so when i click on meals and it goes to this little meals list just to list all the goodies that we're going to eat uh here i just put a breakpoint in here where i'm uh calling the service to tell me to get everything that I need. Uh, I just have this breakpoint and here it is on the client. So I can actually come in here and use all the same debugging tools. I had some in here before from a previous debugging session. Um, I can actually see what they are. I could run, I could step through, I could do all that stuff. If I do a resume, it'll keep going and it should hit any other breakpoints. And I do have some random breakpoints in here. So who knows what else might, <laughs> pop up, but here in the actual dot razor file itself, right? So there's some HTML here. And then I have my razor code, which is C sharp. And here's where it's determining if, you know, there was a picture associated with this particular meal. If not, then it's just throwing out a little default one. Uh, so here I might want to step through this or see what's available here. And the same thing, you'll see the local variables I can see all of the information right about that entity that I just brought down. I can step through and do all these cool little things that you would use in the debugger um, every day, right? So you get the full stack here with all the, you know, whatever shortcut keys and key maps you have would work just fine, right? I can walk through, I could keep running, et cetera, et cetera. And you notice if it walks through, it does find the end, right? It can't walk through HTML. That's not a thing that it does. Um, and then here I could keep running and it goes through each meal in the list in this case. All right, so I could keep going and going. And if you can debug off. HTML, does that mean HTML is a programming language? Oh, no, are we going to have this? Are we going to have this chat again? So, <laughs> Matt, oh, wait, we should. Don't start we, it, Matt. Don't. He, it's too late. Matt's out of the bag. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, all the right, comments are going to go wild now. Audience, vote. Is HTML a programming language or not? Oh, Let's no, hear totally you all in the comments. Everything. I do apologize. Yeah, I totally want to derail the whole party. Is HTML a programming language or not? So <laughs> regardless, we need it. And here's a great way to debug stuff that's interspersed with HTML, right? Razor code. So this is great. Like it's seamless. It's the same debugging tools, but now also on the client with Blazor. So that's pretty awesome. I really love how you can just shove a breakpoint in here, you know, right next to some HTML and you don't, you can still use your browser tools, right? They're, they're just fine. But here I could just come in here and use everything right inside of Rider. So that's just absolutely wonderful. I love this. So, so web development is super fantastic now with these, you know, between endpoints and this, like, it's, I'm very happy. So, Okay, so that's what I have then, and I think now we go to another person for other yeah, cool it's stuff. Yeah, me. It's, it's me. I'm going to try not to make any more kind of bad comments about HTML and stuff, um, but I'm still going to talk about um, debugging, and I'm just going to show a couple of teeny tiny features which are really nice, little sort of quality of life things uh, for debugging. I've got a, a little demo um, program here, which is boring. It creates an instance of a class and calls a method, uh, what's interesting is, is I've got a, um, a property here, which is going to throw an exception. And if I start debugging this, then the obvious thing is going to happen when I try and look at the property in the debugger, then um, we get an exception thrown here. And every time I make uh, I step, if I go into so, into like a, another, um, uh, into another method and so on, I can then uh, see this exception thrown every single time. And it's basically, it's really annoying um, because we're just gonna keep on getting lots of exceptions. And every time you evaluate things, uh, we see error messages with uh, Rider. We can now, I've done this because I've just run my demo. With Rider, you can now right click on it and disable the evaluation of the item there, which means that now it, it won't evaluate that as you step along. So it's a nice way of just being able to say, I don't care that this is going to give me an error, ignore it, ignore the errors uh, and so on. Uh, we can click refresh to show it and see what's gonna happen, or we can right click then and uh, enable it back in again. 
The nice thing about this, though, is that Rider will do it automatically for you. So if it tries to evaluate a property or something um, too many times and it will uh, throw too many errors, it will automatically disable evaluation for you. So that's a, a nice, uh, cute thing, which is very sort of helpful to try and get rid of some of the noise. Second thing I want to show you is the debugger gives us a lot of information and it can give us um, a bunch of information that we don't necessarily have at, um, at, at compile time. So here I've got a list of strings, uh, and we know that it's a concrete list uh, because I'm creating it right there. I'm passing it to this method do something, uh, but then do something pulls this in as an I enumerable. When I'm using this uh, in source code, I don't know what kind of I enumerable that is. I don't know what anything about it. But if I sort of step into it, obviously I can look at the debugger and the debugger tells me it's a list of string. But there's a little bit more than that. I can sort of right click on it and I've got two items here, jump to source and jump to type source. Uh, jumping to source, I'm in the, the uh, locals window here, by the way, just to be clear. I'm right clicking on names in the locals window. Jump to source will take me up to the parameter. And if I go and do jump to type source, it knows it's a list and the debugger knows that this particular type instance is a list and can navigate me straight there. So two sort of really nice little uh, items there. Uh, which are useful for debugging. And the other thing I wanted to show then is we've made a few changes to this to the exception settings we've got in the debugger as well. So we've got the debugger item here, and we've got some uh, options here about what we do when there are unhandled exceptions. We've traditionally had this break on unhandled exceptions. You tend to want that on because normally if you get an unhandled exception, your application will crash. So it's usually a good idea for the debugger to tell you about it. Um, we've expanded this one, break on user unhandled exceptions, where we can ignore certain exceptions as well. So if we want to hear about various exceptions, that's great. But if there's things like um, operation cancelled exception or task cancelled exception, they're just noise uh, a lot of the time there. You've probably got a better exception which is being thrown, uh, and so we can ignore those as well. So it's just, again, uh, a slight bit of quality of life then to, to clear things up. Um, so that's really it for debugging. And unless anybody has any sort of quick questions, I'll move on to another topic. Anyone? Well, I, I just noticed the uh, ordering of your list of names. I'm I'm furthest away from you, Matt. I thought we were friends. It's um it's alphabetical. <clears throat> oh, okay. <laughs> it's really not alphabetical. It's just <laughs> it's it's alphabetical. HTML is a programming language, and this is alphabetical. <laughs> How dare you? We All went right. from I'm party to Fight Club. It's okay. It's I'm, fine. I'm I'm sorry. What can I say? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, let me see. Can I move it up? There you go. Look at that. Okay. okay. I feel better. And, and look, see that's the, that's the kind of pro I am. I use the rearrange code keyboard shortcut to move things around, um, keeping the. I mean, look at that. The, the commas correct. Look at that. Wow. It's Isn't just amazing. 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 Yeah, so um, you see, I deliberately put them in the wrong order so that you would pick up on that so that I could demo just that feature. And Amazing. now I'm going to move on. I Thanks, know. everybody. Oops. <laughs> uh, oh, I appear to have just managed to close Rider. So uh, let's fire that up again. Okay, so um, I was going to move on and I was going to show uh, talk a bit about some of the, the game dev stuff we've been working on. Um, we've got a, a couple of things to show around that. Uh, this is work we do with Unity. Uh, and also Unreal. And um, I'm actually running the preview version of Rider for Unreal Engine, and I'll come back to that in a sec. I'm going to start and have a quick look at Unity stuff. Let me just uh, load up the solution. Before I click go, um, the, the thing that I want to show you is actually part of the loading. It's, it's not um, been a, um, a, a very big release for, for Unity features here, but there's been a number of things happening under the covers. Uh, there's some performance stuff going on. Uh, one of the things that I really like is a small piece, but again, quality of life type stuff is that uh, when we load up a Unity project, we load up your source code, obviously. That tends to live in the Assets folder. Uh, we've also got a Packages folder, which we show in the Solution View. And normally, um, previously, that has waited until the entire project was loaded, and then we'd show the project. Now we show it immediately. So if I load that up, uh, we should get the Solution window open any second, and we should get a uh, package shown straight away. Come on, you can do it. This is why I didn't want to close the app. Look at it reader under Windows there. Screen sharing is great. So there we go. So it, it's just a nice little thing there. It's, it's, it's that whole sort of um, attention to sort of performance type things. We want to try and uh, 
uh, get you to your code and to get you to the files that you need uh, straight away there. So you're in packages here. It's opened it up. It's remembered where I was there, whereas previously that was uh, automatically closed. So it's a, a small thing, but uh, a nice thing. Now, you might have noticed I have Unity open in the background. Uh, and if you have a look, now is not the time to be installing new versions of IntelliJ. See, Toolbox is a fantastic application, and you can install lots of things side by side. But sometimes when you have nightly builds, they can get pushed out in the middle of a presentation. And um, yeah, timing. Timing's everything. Um, so I have my sample app of Unity here. And you can see the little asterisk there by the main menu. I don't know if you can see that because I've created a new game object. Let's create another one here. Uh, create game object. And there we go. So I've got unsaved changes in my um, application here. And I'll switch back to Rider. I'll write some code and everything. I want to commit something in. Go to the commit window. I've got some files saved in Git ready to go. I can do, um, you know, uh, bid something great. And then one of the things that we've added for this release, which is really nice, is this item down here, check unsaved Unity scenes. We've got a connection to the Unity editor. And so one of the things we can do is quite simply ask the editor, do you have any unsaved scenes? And we can do that, we can check, and we'll warn it. We'll warn you now. So that, that's a very useful way to make sure that you've got all the files uh, saved before you're ready to commit there. Simple one, you can commit anyway, or you can cancel and come back and save. Um, another little feature we've got is we've done some work with um, the quick doc tooltips. So you might well be familiar with, uh, there we go, the quick documentation tooltips we've got. It shows you the um, a little summary from the API that there is there. And also we've got this link down here, external documentation for update. If we click that, then, um, oh la la, lots of different windows. Let me just, wow, zoom, zoom, zoom. So yeah, so if we click that, we then get our um, uh, documentation for mono behavior updates. If we do the same for start, we'd get, we'd get that. But what we can do now is this time, we've made some uh, updates, uh, much needed updates really. And you can use the context help keyboard shortcut uh, action there with keyboard shortcut. And that will just take you straight to the page that you want there. You can see the, the window opening in the background there. So uh, a very simple thing, keyboard shortcut to jump around uh, and get you to the external documentation. A um, couple of other things to add for Unity, which are nice. Again, talk about debugging, few debugging improvements there. So if you are using a local player, which is a UWP, whatever UWP stands for these days, Unified Windows Process or something, I can't remember. Um, but the... Um, the, the new model of, of Windows processes, the Windows 10 style um, Windows processes, if you are doing local debugging of those, we now support that directly in the editor. If you try to connect to one of those, we'll configure everything so that the networking works correctly and debugging works appropriately. Um, we've also made uh, debugging a lot smoother for players which are based on IL to CPP, where Unity rewrite your, um, your, your .NET intermediate language into C++ and recompile it. Uh, so we've got sort of fewer exceptions happening uh, there. We, we And um, you get a much smoother experience working with that. So these are exceptions thrown by Unity itself. We kind of uh, handle those uh, cleaner and nicer for you. And um, you can enable those again if you want to and still need them. Uh, and finally, with debugging, a recent change in Unity means that the exit GUI exception is always thrown a lot. And we've suppressed that as well, so you don't uh, don't fail on that. Matt, so, very, um, very important question. Yes. So, someone said, why, why does it say Rider for Unreal if you're showing Unity? That was also perfect timing, because I'm just moving into Rider for Unreal. So um, we have got Unreal support um, for in Rider as well, but it's a preview. So we've got an actual different uh, build in much the same way we're doing with um, the, the ReSharp for Visual Studio 2022. We've got a separate download and a separate install to work with Rider for Unreal. So um, traditionally, we've had uh, ReSharp C++. We've had that for many years now, and um, we've been wanting to build that and pull that into into Rider, we've had Rider as a game dev uh, environment for Unity. We're now extending that to be a game dev environment also for Unreal. Uh, and this has been in preview now for well over a year, um, possibly longer. 
uh, and we're working on it. We're working on making sure that the C++ engine works really well with Unreal, which is a, a big use case for uh, C++ analysis. And um, we, so we, we have a separate preview for that. So you can download that. Now you can join the preview. You can download that. The version I'm showing you here is the 2021.2 preview. It's uh, based on the, the released version of 2021.2. So it's got the Unity um, stuff there um, as well as the Unreal stuff. Um, but it's got a whole lot of Unreal things in there. And the first thing is quite blatantly staring us in the face. I'm on a Mac, and traditionally, Unreal development is on Windows. But we've supported uh, Unreal on Mac now. So we, we can actually build and uh, work with projects running on a Mac. And normally, what would happen here is you generate a solution file, Visual Studio solution file, Visual C++ project files we can load the U project files directly. So we don't actually need to have solution files and project files anymore. We just use the existing uh, U project uh, files there and the build.cs files and so on. And we can uh, load those up, read those directly and build a project model off the back of that. And so we can see here now we're just loading up uh, a U project uh, directly, we can see that we've got sort of uh, projects listed there. And if I click on that, it takes me to the to the build.cs file, which describes that particular project, uh, which is cool. Um, and we get all the normal sort of features you'd expect from C++ and uh, Unreal support in there, uh, you know, inspections, um, syntax highlighting, quick fixes, navigation, refactorings, um, alt enter, all that kind of stuff there, uh, testing and so on. And we've also got the cool uh, Unreal features that are in there as well. Um, we will do things like we'll run Unreal header tool uh, on your files as you type, and it'll pull out those, and it'll give you sort of warnings about these uh, U-class macros uh, and so on. Um, and um, and yeah, and it now works with with uh, Unreal on Mac, which is uh, pretty cool. So a few other improvements that have happened in this release as well is uh, debugging works with, um, sorry, improvements around debugging. So with some of the uh, NAT viz uh, visualize visualizations of various types, we've got a, a lot more sophisticated in how we handle those and they, they work a whole lot better. Uh, and we've also understand the um, Unreal code style. And so we will configure Resharper C++, just the Resharper C++ engine underneath all of this. We will configure that to work with the standards that Unreal have as well. Uh, and the other thing which is um, very useful for, we've got a lot of good feedback for, is um, we've got a plugin called EasyArgs, um, which is uh, really nice there. It just adds a little uh, combo box to your tool window here, and you can add extra command line arguments to the uh, run configuration that is uh, kicked off when you want to try and build your editor, when you want to run your game, run your editor, uh, and so on. So um, yeah, I think that's uh, everything I really want to show with game dev. Again, if anybody has any questions, uh, they can jump in now or I'll have a look in the comments and see. And if not, I'm gonna hand over to the next. De definitely. <clears throat> By the way, uh, before just before you started, someone pointed out that they uh, like the Unity support really much. And folks, if you have anything that you see here or in the course of the remaining, just let us know if you love it, uh, that would be great. And I think next one is Khalid with F Sharp. All right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, like uh, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Can can you folks hear me? You can hear me, right? Oh, we can okay. hear and see you. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right. Perfect. Let me close everything and then bring up. Uh, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I really spent uh, a long time learning F Sharp and building things and. Uh, living the DevRel lifestyle, one of the things we constantly have to do when we write blog posts is take that uh, first frame out of a GIF. So I actually ended up writing an F-sharp utility called freeze frame uh, in F-sharp. Uh, and I guess what I found personally is the F-sharp experience in Rider uh, is pretty awesome. Uh, and with this particular release, there are some uh, quality of life improvements specifically for F-sharp developers. Uh, a lot of things like actions. Uh, one of the first things too is you can optimize uh, some of your uh, open statements at the top of the file. So uh, as you can see here, some of the first three here uh, are grayed out because I'm not actually using them in my application. Uh, so I can hit the uh, control option O, uh, let's see, 
and it actually removes all of the unused open statements uh, in my application. Uh, Matt actually showed how you can move uh, items uh, up and down in terms of scope. So here I have a type uh, of shape uh, and I can, I can actually reorder these things, um, which is really nice. Not only that, you can move things up and down, you can actually move things uh, left and right. So let's go ahead and try to do that. Uh, sometimes the commands are a little tough to pull off. Oh, wrong one. Oh, wrong one again. Oh, I have caps locks on. Um, so yeah, so you can see uh, I moved the width over uh, and then I moved it back over. So scopes, uh, F-sharps, uh, helper, uh, like shortcut actually understands um, the the format. Here we can move this over again. Uh, so length now is in front of width, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, this also works in uh, terms of uh, parameters uh, in, into say like uh, up here I have a constructor. Uh, this will break my code, but you can also see how it kind of moves things around. So I'll move this character over uh, where the string was and you can see, you can just kind of move things, which is kind of pretty awesome. Uh, you can see all the crazy <laughs> shortcuts here on the on the screen. Uh, another nice thing uh, as well uh, that C Sharp developers have that F Sharp developers are going to get in this current release uh, is postfix prefixes. So here I've defined a tuple uh, of one and two. I know it's not really that uh, exciting. Uh, but if I go ahead and I type dot let, uh, I can go ahead and press enter. Oops, sorry. Let me delete this comment and try that again. You'll see that we actually declared, uh, you know, a variable for you. And now you can just use it, uh, which is really nice. Another thing we can do is we can actually deconstruct these types. Uh, up here, I have this, uh, you know, horrible definition of a shape uh, that no one can even imagine. Uh, it has one, two, three, four, five different sizes, uh, sides and different lengths. Uh, but you can actually pass it in as that type, uh, or you can actually run our command uh, here and deconstruct it into its tuple. Uh, and you can see now we have F1, two, three, and four. Uh, so those are some of the nice uh, additions we've added to F Sharp uh, and the F Sharp experience in Rider, uh, specifically around postfix uh, note or uh, prefixes uh, where we like expand into a variable. Uh, we're looking to add more of those uh, as the F Sharp experience gets better. So uh, if you work in C Sharp and you're used to uh, other uh, postfix templates. Uh, you should expect to see more kind of show up in F-sharp. Uh, so yeah, that's generally, those are the improvements uh, in the F-sharp experience for folks uh, using F-sharp uh, and Writer together. So yeah, that's it for me. Thanks, Khalid. That's yep. really cool. I always, I always, I'm always excited seeing Postfix template. It's one of my favorite features. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel is next, I think, with code cleanups. Rachel, are you ready? Still muted? Let's wait for you. Yeah, still muted, but the screen is there already. Oh, there we go. I lost the mouse for a minute, had to unmute. <laughs> so code cleanup, um, of course, this is something that's been in Rider for a while, but now we've made a few changes to make it a little bit easier. Uh, so one of these is if I just want to run the cleanup, we have a more of a consolidated user interface where the dialogue was kind of split up. So I might take some code. In this case, I'll just select the entire file and I'll do a control E and C. Uh, you can also uh, use like shift shift or go through the menu if you like. And I get the reformat and cleanup code. So here's where things have been consolidated into this nice dialogue here. Uh, so obviously I get my scope selection and it realizes that I had selected some text. Uh, I could also have just left it at the file, uh, but also you get uncommitted files or changes uncommitted or custom scope, right? So you could pick out what you want here. And then your profile, which is full cleanup or just the reformat and apply syntax style or reformat code. And if you look at these options that are showing up in here, 
these are the same options that you can set if you go into file and settings and you get all the um, cleanup, the re, uh, renaming, refactoring, a lot of those different settings, they're all in here, right? So you can see them and just uh, look at them here and see how you want to optimize or how it's going to be optimized and you can reset them in the settings. Um, so I, once I do this, well, let's go back to the code and just take a look at what it looked like really quick and then come back in here. Uh, so some things that are set in my settings, uh, one of them is var instead of the type, right? There's a nice new little shortcut. And notice if you do an alt enter, it also suggests that, right? So that was one of these suggestions as per my settings. And then also another one as part of the code cleanup settings, uh, if I go into file and, and settings would be the if statement. This is a you know classic if expression brackets, and then just one line of code, else brackets, one line of code. Well, if there's more than one line of code in here, then I don't, uh, I might want those brackets, but if not, I could compact this if then, make it a little bit more readable. Now, I could do that with the classic alt enter and go into, you know, format or cleanup selection, uh, or I could use the, the nice consolidated dialog. So you do have your choice and I'll do the whole file and we'll go back in there and look again. So I'll do my control EC and my selected text. So full cleanup. And if I look here right in the beginning, oh yes, the var style. And if I move down a little bit, you'll see some stuff about uh, the braces and some of those other rules that I had set in the settings. So once I say okay to that, it goes through and does the cleanup and it takes it a second or two. It has to actually scan the code and make some changes. Uh, also the namespaces, if you noticed, I, did, uh, I didn't point it out, but I had a couple extra unused namespaces. That's, that's always very annoying, right? Because you have those and, and you never get around to going and taking them out or doing an alt enter and telling it to. Well, here it just does it for you. But if I take a look back here now, oh, nice and compact, right? I didn't, you know, it doesn't, actually it's more readable without the brackets in this case. It makes it a little bit easier because it is one line uh, or here. All right, it cleaned up that var for me. So all of that stuff, as per my settings, it just did a nice cleanup. So that's really great, all consolidated into one window. Uh, additionally, so I just cleaned it up here, but maybe I don't want to, you know, run this at this time or by myself. Maybe I just want to make it a little more automatic. Uh, what I could do is pick out whatever files I want, and I could come in here in my commit window when I'm going to commit say I didn't even run it or I just got lazy and I ran it in half of the files to do a code cleanup and then I got tired. Uh, so I could come in here and say, hey, look, I want to clean up when I check in, right? When I do my commit, right? Also, I could do things like I usually have the check to do checked off as well uh, because then it'll give you a little to-do list, any to-do comments that you had. It goes through and it looks. Uh, also, some other things you can do before the commit, but this integrates with that cleanup, right? It's the same cleanup. So if I have that checked, I do, we're good. All right, do my commit message. Probably want a better commit message that actually says something. And I do the commit and you can see the inspect code runs. It goes through, it's running them, it's cleaning up the code. And after it does the commit, then I'll be able to see some of these commit logs with the differences and the cleanups. Uh, so it's just the fact that it's going to take a while because I selected a whole bunch of files there, but it will go through, clean them up, do what it has to do. All right. So uh, quite nice. I don't think I want to wait for the whole thing. So I'll just click, click cancel on that, but, but it works quite nicely. So also, if I clean up my code now, then the next time I do the demo, I won't have any any code to clean up. There, I did pick out some of the cleanup code in here as well. Um, and I had this cleaned up before. So really nice. You can do that right on the commit if you don't feel like doing it at any other particular time. Uh, so new feature is that consolidated uh, cleanup for and cleanup in the commit. So who's next? I actually have a, a question, Rachel. Yeah. D tabs are spaces. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I know nobody ever says that, do they? I'm like, whatever the team that I have to work on does. Right, whatever they want. We're going to ask for answers in the comments now. 
Just we can tabs really... or spaces. This right. does cause like serious fights. I'm like, people, it still but, works. It's still code. Actually, yep. does it matter? Like if you have an IDE like writer, it doesn't actually matter, does it? Because it works with both. It it does everything you need. It does, you know, you know, and it's all configurable and you can share your settings with your team. So it doesn't actually matter, does it? This is the, the best argument I heard was about um, visually impaired people. And particularly if you know someone on the team might have that, then taps are actually better. And I know that because of, what's his name? Brad Wilson, I think, from the X-Unit uh, project. So yeah, that's something to consider maybe. So if um, you're pairing with somebody and they demand one or the other? No, I, I think the idea is that that if you uh, if you have a visual impairment, you can actually set the tap width and automatically jump farther, so that it's, it becomes more clean that that you're actually. In, in oh, the that makes that makes sense for accessibility, sure, sure. But then, like for me, um, then it, again, it comes down to it doesn't matter for me. But yeah, if you have an actual accessible need, that's a little different. So. Yeah. yeah. All right, I think I'm next, and um, this is a very special moment for me. For one reason, today is the day I'm going to show my good friend Rodney also a couple of Xamarin things. Hi, Rodney. Um, but I will be pretty quick because I have no idea about Xamarin. But some parts Rider makes really cool. So first is we have uh, some editors for the assets, uh, you know, Xcode assets basically. So you will have, uh, you will see those for colors. So you have a color picker for icons and also for images and most importantly, for, for app icons and images, you can also drag and drop. And I planned this really well because I'm dropping. Oh, no, that was the wrong one. Let me see. That should be PDF the first. But the second one will work. And this is Dave. Dave will be very soon. <laughs> I merged this in really nicely. Uh, Dave, Dave will also have a webinar really soon next week, I think, with us uh, about uh, static. So. Make sure to check that out. Um, the second thing I want to show you is an Android or Xamarin developers probably already know about this. Um, yeah, you can see my, my PC also is heavy on the on the screen sharing. Um, I think Android is going to more or less abandon the APK um, extension and in favor of the Android app bundle. I think so. From the right click um, option for properties here, you will have the opportunity to change that to AAB and then check, just check OK. And probably also make sure that you, not, not like me, that you also apply for uh, all the configurations that you need. So right now, I think I only did uh, debug or release, uh, one of the two. The third thing I want to say about Xamarin is, and that, that's not really something I can show you because it's just less, less errors actually. So if you're working with Android resources, then what we do now is to regenerate the, the, resource, uh, um, the resources designer file and yeah, basically just eliminate some of the errors that you might uh, have previously. And yeah, I hope, I hope that's it about Xamarin. Um, let me see. The next one is Khalid again with some parts about UX. Yeah. So yeah, if you get, can you folks see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So the, these are like small things. Uh, I know Ryder uh, and the UI team that works on Ryder really prides itself on some of the small things that kind of add up to big quality of life improvements. So, uh, on the latest release of Rider, uh, some folks may notice it, some folks may not, uh, but now we have a transparent title bar here at the top. So there actually used to be a line right under here that separated the title bar from uh, the rest of Rider, and now you don't see it. Uh, funny enough, before the call, Martin was like, hey, your instance of Rider looks a little different. What's going on? Uh, and I was like, oh, it's the transparent title bar. Uh, so. You might feel like something is different, but not know what I, what it is exactly. Uh, it's likely the transparent title bar. Um, the other thing that's really changed in Rider, and I think people will really notice, um, 
people new to Rider will just expect that it just works because, um, you know, you'd expect it to work. Uh, but now you can actually drag, uh, you know, tabs and you can actually place them in different places uh, where you want them to be. So this is kind of new, the ability to drag these. Uh, you can drag, uh, I think you can drag tool windows as well out uh, and do these kind of things. So uh, it's pretty neat uh, that you can do that now. Uh, there's also this dock button so you can dock things back. But, um, you know, if you use the mouse, if you're not part of the Vim master race that Matt Ellis is part of, uh, using the mouse and dragging windows is is really nice. So. Yeah, that's that's it for some of the UX UI improvements uh, in Rider. Uh, back to you, Matthias. Yeah, back to me with my heart. It, it slips a bit. Uh, let me see. Yes, uh, someone took care of my screen. Thanks for that. Um, so let me see. I actually want to switch to uh, Visual Studio. Yes. So one of the things. And, and I'm really excited about that. Um, I hope you you will be too, but uh, look at that. So um, for instance, I have a collection of working days here. And first, what I want to do is select uh, that that um, that the hours are greater than eight. So because we want to check for over hours working days, basically. And also here, we're using pattern matching. And I, I think my PC is a bit slow. Um, and just check if it's not Saturday or Sunday. Okay, now here's one thing, if, um, and I will just tell you, um, but the working days property will actually um, throw an exception if you access it for, uh, for the day of, we uh, when, when it's Saturday or Sunday. So I will show you that later. It's not, not really, and it doesn't make any sense actually, but let's say we want to remove this filtering here, this where uh, call. So before, what you could do was to use structural navigation and then you select uh, basically the whole range here up until the end and then you could delete that, right? So I'm personally a bit more accustomed to, to using expand shrink selection and that works with, um, with control W and now, um, this, 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 now it works a bit differently because first when, when you use that, then first it would select this where and afterwards, uh, this part. But in most cases, I guess this was not really, didn't make too much sense, let's say. Uh, it was the less popular way people wanted to select their, their, their code. Um, but not, now, actually, it will first select the whole uh, end range, basically. And afterwards, it will um, grow or extend to the, to the full variable initialization. Um, what else? Ah, yeah. And actually, that's also a, a second thing that, that, I, that I already showed you is structural remove. So in this case, we have, we have a bunch of where, um, bunch of where calls. And you see, I'm, I'm actually not selecting the first or the second dot here. But when I press, okay, I, I didn't properly select. So let's use the proper selection method again. That's something to keep in mind. So if you use the mouse to select that, then it won't work. But if you're using expand string selection or structural navigation, um, then it will remove this extra dot for you and, um, and you're basically done. I think the same should work here with the OR. You see OR was also removed from that. Um, and also, sorry, Kelly, I couldn't hold it. <laughs> I still, I still we'll love move you. him down. He needs to be further down. Further down? No, I mean, move Khalid further down. He's too high up in that list. No, I actually wanted to remove him. <laughs> oh, man. This is uh, this is bullying on a corporate slash streaming level. I can't take it. Uh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm just joking. You're the best. I'm, just, I'm typing an HR email as, as we speak. So Let, let me let me put you at, at the top, OK? All right. It, it, I'll Please, please don't send anything. <laughs> but I, I really but, like this. I think, um, I think it's a key point. I think it's a key point you made though, there, though, if you are, if you want this structural remove to work, you have to be working semantically to begin with. So you have to use the extend and shrink selection or it doesn't work because it doesn't know what kind of semantic selection you've got at the moment to be able to remove stuff correctly. So if you are uh, using a semantic 
based selection, you get semantic based remove characteristics as well. Which exactly. is really cool. So so hence either the ex expand shrink selection or structure uh, structure navigation. Um, second thing I want to show you in, in Sharp here is Pico style. Oh man, I, I haven't heard about this style until we prepared the what's new page. But here you can see, oh, actually, actually, let me do this again. So just to re also repeat that feature a bit for you, um, you can actually just select some code, then go to format selection, go here, configure. Uh, this dialog will show you only the, um, the, the settings that are meaningful in that context. And now we can actually go here and use the Pico style and then save as common, save, save to, to, um, to an actual settings file, uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, See, I, that style is as bad as tabs and spaces, isn't it? Oh just my. Like, look at that, just look at I, that. You know, Matt, you and I are friends because as soon as we saw Pico style, no offense to anyone who does it, but there was just visible disgust on all our faces. Yeah, no, no offense really, to anybody yeah. who does it, but you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but it's there. It we added it, <laughs> so it's great. <laughs> also, also I have basically the same the same example in uh, in Rider, but in this case, I just want to show you a couple of different things, and that is um, already in a previous version we uh, kind of unified our um, our visualization for um, XML doc com uh, comments. So this what what I use now was quick documentation. Um, I actually also assigned a special uh, shortcut for for this. Uh, I think which one is it? Is it quick? I think this one. Yeah. Um, but you can also, of course, use the cursor to just show up the tooltip. And the special thing here is now that we have lots of lots more um, of colorization here. Um, so I think two versions ago, we didn't even have colorization for, for the attributes. Yeah, let me scroll this a bit up also. And, and you will also see that it will show the proper, um, the proper generic type uh, in this case. And also for, for this one, for the, list, uh, for the list type here, there's also the shortcut or, or the link to go to the Docs Microsoft uh, website if you if you care to read a bit about documentation. And I think I'm not sure if Matt actually mentioned that during the Unity, but Unity also has that for for the documentation there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's a separate keyboard shortcut to take you directly to the external yeah. docs as well. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, I actually forgot to one for. F sharp, yeah. <laughs> I forgot to mention F sharp also has this documentation uh, update as well. So uh, if you're using F sharp libraries uh, that are documented, uh, you will get that new style of uh, documentation view. Yeah. Cool. I think that's it about editor stuff in the Sharp and Writer. Um, Khalid, I, I switched the, the order. So now you're up with front end development. Yeah, yeah. So um, if you can see my screen, uh, you know, uh, yes. one of the nice things about Rider, and I think Martin alluded to this in the chat, is uh, Rider is part of the IntelliJ IDEA family, uh, which means any work that's happening in other IDEs, uh, if there's any overlap with uh, the workflows in the .NET space, specifically around web development, uh, Rider users get that benefit as well. So uh, here is a React app that's actually running in an ASP.NET Core application. Uh, and one of the nice things if you're using React and you're using hooks uh, is now, thanks to the WebStorm team, you can actually rename, uh, you can rename hooks. And as you noticed, it uh, changed the name up here and it changed the name down there. So if you're a big React user, I think you're really gonna enjoy that feature. Uh, another feature that folks will really uh, enjoy when they're doing their JavaScript and front-end web development, uh, development um, is automatic imports. So uh, here I have a Lambda module that I export, and I'm exporting this Lambda method. Uh, and if I go back to my app.js, uh, all I need to do is actually call that method uh, in here. You can see that... Uh, Re 
like uh, the WebStorm tooling inside of Rider found this Lambda method. And if I go ahead and press enter, uh, you'll notice that we actually auto imported uh, the Lambda method as well. So those are some nice quality of life improvements uh, for um, uh, folks doing web development inside of Rider and maybe focusing more on front end development uh, frameworks like React as their UI experience uh, and letting ASP.NET Core do what it does best, which is uh, back end APIs. Uh, another nice thing that kind of comes with WebStorm, uh, if you're running uh, your web applications, make sure to go up into your edit configuration. Uh, and if you have an ASP.NET Core uh, run configuration, go down here and check this with JavaScript debugger. You can actually choose which browser, but I usually normally leave it at Chrome. Uh, for me, it has some of the better developer tools. Um, but yeah, you can actually come in here uh, and start debugging. And what you'll actually notice, hopefully it does this this time, um, it should spin up a Chrome instance in incognito mode. Uh, so right now it's just running my NPM scripts uh, and things are happening. Uh, and this is kind of the amazing part of Rider and some of the WebStorm tooling. Um, don't get dizzy. This is the Rider logo just spinning for you. Uh, but one of the amazing things uh, about Rider uh, is it kind of brings in this WebStorm tooling uh, in Rider. So if you're used to the debugging tools uh, over here, uh, you actually don't have to open these things anymore. The, it's, it's really not necessary. Uh, let me see if I can um, show you. So this is the index file, but I also have a signup file, which is just a static uh, file. So if I come in here, um, actually it's in my dub dub root, which is actually being uh, shown. Oh, so let's see. Hopefully this uh, actually connected. Uh, let me go back into the debugger says it's connected. I'm going to go ahead and try to stop and restart it. Um, the curse the curse of screen sharing, I think, is uh, taking place here. But it's building right now. Uh, it should kind of hook up into this. So you just saw this flash occur. Um, OK, let's see if I can get to it. Sign up.html. So uh, here's kind of the amazing thing. So uh, go ahead and hide. When I actually click my HTML elements uh, inside of Rider, it's actually highlighting uh, the HTML elements in my Chrome instance. So you can kind of see that occurring. Oh, it was occurring. That, there it is, right? So uh, in addition to that, I can actually do um, real-time updates. So I went from a super cool website to a super duper cool website. Uh, I can also change uh, some of the colors. So let me find the button here. Maybe I don't like this blue color. Let's go. Let's live dangerously because Martin likes to live on the edge, uh, like he said earlier. So now our button is red. Uh, and some of these things are uh, really neat. Um, you actually have the console window in here. So if I want to actually write console log, hello uh, stream, you'll actually notice uh, it showed up in the console in the Chrome instance that we're debugging. So that's kind of one of the nice things that you get when you uh, use Writer for your web development. Uh, a lot of the tooling and a lot of the experience that WebStorm users get uh, just comes uh, by default inside of the writer experience. And some of this debugging experience that uh, the newest version of writer has uh, is really, really amazing, uh, especially when it comes to uh, debugging and uh, live reloads. Uh, if you're actually dealing with a lot of HTML, you don't even have to open the window anymore. Uh, if you look at up here, you'll see all the little browser windows uh, and you'll actually notice the writer icon. So now you can just click and actually do those modifications in place. So uh, maybe I don't want to live dangerously. Maybe I just want to live 
uh, on the warning uh, side of things. Uh, when I save that, it auto updates uh, inside of Writer. So yeah, that's uh, the new web uh, experience live edit uh, features that are in Writer in the latest uh, release of Writer. So try those out. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy them. So yeah, that's it for me. All right, back to back to me, and I have a couple of more things coming from from Idea. Uh, resetting my screen. Um, I have a couple more things coming from Idea, as we already or did we mention or did we talk about it? I don't know. But some of you may know, Rider uh, always inherits a couple of uh, features from Idea, uh, which also has a complete team behind it. Uh, so this is great. We just earn all the features basically, the same as with Web, as with, uh, web Store. And uh, this this is what I'm going to show you is about uh, VCS integration. And the first for that is that let's go here. Um, that's like a very very minor change. But before that, um, this changes was named default uh, change set. And if you haven't seen change sets before, um, this is a really great way to organize all your all your changes. So, for instance, you can create a new uh, change lists, or I did say a change set, right? So, in idea, it's cha uh, set, um, change list, and we ju can just create that, and then we can use various techniques to actually uh, move changes from one change list to another. We can use drag and drop here. We can do it. Uh, right from inside the file, uh, many actually. But keep in mind, this will be no longer your default change list, but it's called changes. Um, so, so also, quick, quick question about those yes. change, uh, change lists. Are you using them to, to essentially keep your commits separate and make sure that any change you make to program doesn't get accidentally committed in your default one? or? Well, I have a couple of use cases for that. So, so my my personal background is also like like some of you maybe too um, that I use Git extensions on Windows before, and Git extensions had, has this feature so that you can uh, you know um, you can uh, sorry I lost it uh, you can basically stage uh, different lines in a single file. And this is the this is the closest inside uh, writer or idea basically. So you can you can actually also for a single file. So you see I have a change here and I have a change here. I could put this change into a different cha change set. I'm not sure sh can I do it from here? No, but if I go to the actual file, so from here, I could actually move this to the single files change change list. And also, I think this is, this is a very great uh, use case for that. And I didn't come up with it by myself, but one of our users uh, uh, ta taught us, or at least me, basically. Um, if you're using, uh, if you're working with passwords, for instance, then this is a great way to separate the one password. You know, you're debugging something. You just you just want to leave it there for a while, but you don't actually want to commit it. And that's the first thing I do with uh, with secrets that I use. I put them into a separate change list uh, because two change lists cannot be committed together. So you can always only commit one change list, and that prevents you from accidentally sending that secret uh, to a public public repo, basically. That's that's a good tip. Today I learned. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of change lists as well, and uh, I use it for a, a similar sort of purpose. Um, it's, I think it's important to point out that they are different to the Git staging area. Uh, but you can also, yes. we've also got support for the Git staging area as well. I don't know if you're about to cover that, Matthias, but um, yeah. you, you can use one or the other. You can't use both, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, another thing, and that, that's also good why, why I mentioned all the change lists, is um, if you use Cherry Pick before, I mean, in previous versions, then then usually what happened was that it will create, it will automatically, oh no, what did, what did happen? Are ah, your local changes, okay. Okay, let me, what should I do? I'm actually not sure why, why is it? I think you triggered the cherry pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's also what I wanted, but let me read. Is it because I have just other changes? Actually, I, I could also just stash them for a moment on a shelf, basically. So let's do this. 
have the best message choice always. Okay, and I guess the second one too. I think so, but let's try. Is it really because, yeah. Okay, then, then let's do this too. Uh, shelf those also. I should have tried that. Okay, but let's go back here. And I forgot what I'm going to change. Ah, cherry pick, yeah, right. Now, if you check, if you cherry pick before, then what happens usually is that a new um, that a new change list is crea created, and it will always be empty in most cases, except you have you know um, except you have um, conflicts or something. And the actual, uh, if you want this old behavior back, you can still uh, do that um, because, like for instance, if you if you select a bunch of commits, like ten commits. Then you will end up with 10 empty change lists if everything goes as planned. If you want uh, to have the old behavior back, then you can do this there. Um, what else do we have? Ah, yeah, that's a great one. So while I was preparing that, um, I will also show you spec flow in a moment, but I want to show you something, uh, something very specific, and I think it's here. So um, I created this project and I, and I deleted some lines and then wanted to go back basically because I, I actually deleted this and then I wasn't sure uh, what again should I insert there if it's not yet implemented, right? And a great way to do this is to use, actually let's remove it actually for now. And a great way to find out about this is to use um, local history. So local history, for those that are not yet familiar with it, um, what it basically does, it's like a, it's like a, like an automatic continuous version control system. So what it does is uh, every once in a while it will save the changes of, of the files that, that you're working with. And let's say you, you deleted some of that code, but you want to go back, but you didn't actually commit something. So now it's lost. You could use the undo stack, right? But on Doomstack is also, well, rather clunky for this kind of uh, thing. So what you can do is use the local history because that will keep a change list or, or um, a version history uh, of your files. You can also select folders. So you would see many, many files for, for a single folder there. Many different options, actually. But what we added here is usually I would go through because I have you know, I did many changes and uh, maybe I don't find the exact thing where, uh, where I removed that line. But now I actually can because I remember it was something with pending, but not exactly sure uh, how the call looked like. Now I can use text search here. And now you see the results that shrink to only the ones that have this pending keywords uh, inside there. And then I could, could say revert right from here or copy it or uh, however you like, but yeah, revert is probably the most, uh, the best way here. And what the heck, yes, there it is. And then I didn't expect it to be full screen, to be honest. Okay, local that was- Local history is awesome. Say again? Local history, is, local history is awesome. It's one yeah. of the best yeah. features in Rider. It's, it's one of the ones which, uh, can absolutely save your butt if you've made a mistake. I've deleted an entire solution once before a demo. Um, you know, I, I, I type the wrong Git. Everyone does it, and um, I managed to get it all back with local history. It's 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 a lifesaver. It'll save the things that happen in between source control. It's really cool. Definitely. Also, I think that's worth to mention. Like you know, sometimes uh, way way long long time ago, what I did was. Um, committing actual commits just as a save point for myself. So uh, what, you, what you can also can do in, in local history, and let's see, local history, I think there, you can put a label onto the current state of your solution. That makes it very easy. You know, if you go back to that dialogue that I just showed, then you can immediately see, okay, this is where I tried approach one, let's say. Uh, this is why I tried approach two, and you will never have to actually cre create branches that that get stale or something or are left on your on your disk. So this is this is much easier. I think. That's cool. 
Um, so three I, I, I explained. Uh, one last I have, and that is um, GBG keys. So the configuration actually takes a bit, but it's not long. So first time I, it's the first time I've been using GPG keys and including installing all the uh, you know tools that you that you need, which which are different uh, between Windows, uh, Unix, and, and Mac, or Linux and Mac. And then you just go here into the uh, into the version control settings. Git. Uh, there you have a configured GPG key. Um, I actually have two because I was. I was not smart enough setting that up with a single one right away. Anyway, you can select that here. And from the next time you commit something, um, your commits are going to be signed, right? So you see this here, uh, which says verified. Um, what you also have to do, of course, is to go into the settings of the hosting service that you use. And the, the docs that we have for that explain uh, GitHub in space, yeah? So those two you can you can check. I'm sure our services will have uh, might have that as well. I'm not exactly sure. But that's a great way to to put a put this nice little verified batch uh, behind your commit. And that's from me for VCS from idea. I think the next one I'm not exactly sure. Is it plugins, right, Martin? <clears throat> let's uh, let's go with plugins. Um, but actually, before we go into plugins, there's one thing that I wanted to mention because I, I don't know. I think we mentioned before that Rider shares a lot of the uh, of the features with IntelliJ, but also with ReSharper. So a lot of the stuff, if you've been here for the entire one hour and forty five minutes already, um, the stuff that I showed at the beginning in ReSharper also works in Rider, of course. Uh, a lot of the formatting stuff that Rachel has been showing also works in ReSharper because she was demoing this in uh, in Rider. So do make sure to check out all of those things in the various tools. And actually, the, the next thing I'm going to show here, I will show it in ReSharper, but it's also available in Rider. So again, um, yeah, both tools pretty much support the same thing. So yeah, uh, talking about plugins, um, both ReSharper as well as Rider have various plugins to do profiling. Uh, there's a marketplace with third-party plugins and so on. And actually, one of the plugins that you get in the box um, with ReSharper and Rider is Dynamic Program Analysis, or DPA. Um, and essentially, what it does is continuously profile your application when it's running. Uh, I actually have a Sudoku solver here. Um, source code is probably not that important to look at. Uh, but the cool thing is, if I run it, it will actually take the sudoku.txt that I have here and try to fill in the zero values over the course of uh, the entire program lifetime and try to actually solve the Sudoku that I created for this tool to solve. And after a couple of million steps, in the end, it will figure out how to solve this Sudoku, I guess. At some point, it's a hard one. Yeah, there we go. So it has been solved in 14 seconds. And you will see at the bottom here that VPA finds some issues in the code that I've written here. But let's say that I did not look at this and I actually have the solution of this Sudoku here. And I can actually make it easier for my program to solve things and just change a line to the actual solution, run it again, and then see what happens. And ideally, this is not going to take 15 seconds. It's actually virtually instantaneous um, to solve this Sudoku. Now, DPA, or Dynamic Program Analysis, has been in ReSharper and Writer for a long, long time. Um, but what we've added since, or, or in the latest release, is the ability to see previous runs. So imagine that I just updated this line and it's actually fast and I think my code is running pretty well. Because I ran it before with the harder solution, I can actually see that the maximum number of allocations that has been happening during the execution of this application at some point exceeded the thresholds that uh, program analysis uh, actually has there. So even if I make it easier on my program, I will still be able to catch those issues that you may not uh, catch otherwise. And actually, I can start optimizing this thing. I know copying cells actually takes quite a while. I can look at this, go in there, look at what uh, DPA is doing. And I know that if I change the type of cell 
to be a struct instead of allocating it on the heap i can allocate on the stack but i know that this will actually uh, fix some of the performance issues and some of the memory allocation issues that i have in this application and once this finishes you'll actually see that in the pa as well so there will be fewer messages that are discovered it, it's a small thing but just wanted to show that dpa is there definitely give it a try and um, the other thing that we just added is essentially that maximum number so that some issues that may go unnoticed can actually be caught when you when you see them happening in there so we optimize things and we now have fewer errors with that let's move on to some some other plugins um, Actually, I'm going to do a, a toolbox commercial again. Toolbox is awesome because it allows you to install uh, all of the JetBrains tools, but you can also install them side by side. And in my case, I have my working writer where I actually do developments, but now I also installed writer separately, pointing to an empty directory so I can get started as if it was a new installation. And you will see the first time, if you're writer curious, you want to get started with writer, uh, you will see that you can actually get started with writer very easily. But Rider will, from now on, uh, also detect the other IDEs that you have installed on your system. So I have Visual Studio on my system. I have code there. I have VS 2022 on there as well, which is still running, which is the warning sign there. But you will see that Rider, just like a web browser, for example, will ask you, do you want to import your key map from Visual Studio? Do you want to import your recent projects? If you have Rider installed, I will also suggest taking all of those Rider settings and bring them along. and. Uh, and you can get started with Rider using those settings. So I could go with Visual Studio 2022. And actually, let's, let's see if that works. Just close it and see what happens. Um, ideally, at some point, it should show that VS is no longer running. It's still running in the background, I think. Anyway, let's, let's go with the dark theme instead. Um, I can import those settings. Um, and then show you some of the other stuff that we've added here. So um, in the plugins, you will see that you can always install, like uh, Matthias has this, this progress bar of the Nyan cats. So you can install custom plugins. We actually have some JetBrains plugins that you can install as well, like the Unity supports. Um, but in the featured plugins, you will see that we actually, we, we looked at the plugin marketplace essentially and found the ones that most people are actually installing. So we wanted to make that easier to discover those. And you will now see that there's uh, IdeaVim, the heap allocations viewer, uh, Xamarin supports, an Azure toolkit that you can install, and the AWS toolkit that you can also install. And um, I think this is a very nice bridge towards uh, Matthias as well, who's going to talk about the SpecFlow plugin, which is now also featured and that you can uh, install on the go as you install a uh, writer on your system or get started with writer on your system. True, true. Let me bring up my screen. Oh, we always click at the same time. I mean, I can tell you about idea of him if anybody's interested. It's, it's, I can, I don't know, I can no, spend no. the it's next like couple Pico of hours. Style, no. it's, it's like Pico style. No time. No time. <laughs> okay. Uh, spec though. So for this, I will I will make it really short. Um, we're rather short because um, we had a dedicated webinar for this. So I encourage you to check that out. But very briefly, um, we have a new... Uh, plugin available for SpecFlow, so you can install it here from from the settings, and there you will see where is it installed. Uh, I always forget to switch to install, um, and there you can see SpecFlow for Rider. So the team behind it is really, really uh, putting a lot of uh, effort into it. Also, this is uh, also uh, maintained uh, and and worked on by a member of the community, and basically what it adds is. Um, a really nice, I, I couldn't even, I, I cannot even say basic because it's already very, uh, quite, quite a lot. But what it does add is um, code completion, for instance. So it will see what given steps you have. So you can say, uh, okay, first number is uh, five, let's say. Uh, then you continue and say, uh, what was, and yeah, I always forget it. But code completion does help here. Uh, let's say one. And then when the two numbers are added, basically, and see, I should use code completion again. Um, two numbers are added. Then the result should be, what is it? Six, right? If my math works correctly. 
And from there on, uh, you also have those uh, little icons here that you used to have uh, also with any unit, X units, etc. You can just go there, run. Uh, actually, what I want to check is if also the shortcut works. Uh, not yet, it seems. But you can run it from here. And then the test should execute. Actually, you already see it's inconclusive. Uh, that will not change because uh, I haven't finished the second step. That's where I was coming from before. Remember with the uh, with the with the local history. So in that case, and I only left it for one reason. Uh, but let's give it give it a second to execute the test. Uh, I need a new MacBook, I think. Okay, I, I will just try to already type. Um, the second thing I wanted to show you here is we also have, um, I think, three, or is it, yeah, two plugins also for testing. Um, besides that, the first is Fluent Validation, and you can uh, actually tell from the fact that I can use the should um, template here, so should, and it will all automatically take the result here, and you just tap, and then you could say, B and we also have a, a result field. Now, actually, I don't want to fool you. Uh, it should be the other way around. But that's that will be my word for the fluent validation. Uh, no, sorry, fluent assertions package shown. Here. So so much fluency. Um, and the second was the second I forgot. The second is verify actually. Yeah, verify is also a plugin that we uh, pushed out. Um, but I, there's also a webinar, so definitely also check that out. I think that's it for for the plugins, right? Yeah, verify fluent, is, fluent assertions and fluent validation. Um, definitely check those plugins out. Uh, would be cool also to to uh, receive your feedback about this. Last but not least, we have solution explorer changes, and I think we switch to Khalid just for one thing. Is that right? Yeah, sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, this applies to anything outside of even web development. Uh, but sometimes you have assets in your solution or your project uh, that you just don't want Rider or ReSharper to kind of scan. Uh, maybe they're generated assets. Uh, in this example, uh, I'm generating, um, say, the output. Let's see. So yeah, like there's our node modules folder uh, or there's a specific app so, or a specific file. You can actually right click, uh, go to tool, is it tools? Um, wait, did I do something wrong? I think you can right click, go to tools and click stop index. So when you do that, uh, you can see that this file is no longer going to be indexed, meaning uh, you won't see the problems and errors show up uh, so that's kind of nice, uh, especially if you have a lot of files that ultimately you don't have any control over. Uh, you can just kind of opt out of indexing. Uh, if you want to get indexing back, you can just go right click, go to tools and say start index again. So that's a really nice uh, addition uh, to Rider. Yeah, that's it. And me again for one brief moment. Um, we also added we also added something for the file properties dialog. So here in good old you know S Simpsons uh, way, writing on the chalkboard. Um, but through the file properties, now you can choose build action for the file that you selected. Actually, you can also select multiple files um, to change change all of them in one go. And of course, also copy to output um, the necessary things here, uh, custom to a custom to a namespace. So not a big change, but good to know, I guess. And the last thing I want to show, and I hope that's it then. And one thing I want to mention afterwards is um, dot peak uh, or decompiler. So, and by the way, this is something just you know if you switch from dark theme to the light theme that sometimes just happens, at least for me. Um, but let's say we want to decompile a single file uh, or, or uh, how's it called, single file app 
Uh, there are so many properties for that. Include everything, you know what I mean. Uh, if we select one of those files and we can open them, add them to the decompiler, and this is actually now able to decompile all the things. So we can see we have a couple of native uh, libraries uh, included in that, which would then on uh, at runtime would be uh, would be unzipped basically or unarchived, unpackaged, and you can just browse your code as as we used to used to do. So here, for instance, you can see, uh, yeah, this, this file actually doesn't have any content, I think, so we won't see anything. But just for you to know, you can uh, decompile those apps now. Last thing I want to mention is uh, command line tools. So inspect code, uh, cleanup code, I think as well. Uh, those now have an option, which is, and I will just write it here, uh, which is no build. Because usually inspect code was, um, you know, it's a, it's a tool to execute all this analysis stuff and code cleanup um, on, on CI. Um, and usually this, this tool required you to first restore uh, all the NuGet packages so that it can properly analyze your solution. Um, now it will do this by default, but if you still choose to, you know, not restore, not build, etc., then you just can pass this argument. Um, to the invocation. And I think this is it. Yeah, this is it. Uh, I want to thank everyone here, our advocates. Well done, everyone. <laughs> um, last thing uh, we want to uh, we want to give a brief uh, moment here is also our roadmap for, for the following version. So for ReSharp and Rider. Uh, just we will go very quickly through for the point three release la uh, later this year. We will, of course, continue working on Visual Studio uh, 2022. Uh, we will have C Sharp 10 support, at least work on it. And just just one thing before I forget it. This is uh, this is not actually what we promised to deliver. Yeah, they're, they're you know how it goes. Uh, so you have plans, but sometimes they might not work out. C sharp 10 support, I'm pretty confident about that, but just regarding some, some of the others. And actually, we I think we had a question regarding C sharp 10 support. So over the course of our EAP, we'll definitely see some something pop up. Um, also, we, have, we will have grammar checking. Um, we're looking forward to, to implement that, uh, which will work as a, as a, that sounds really interesting because it's a JVM process next beside the Sharper. Right, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, Blazor support, we have writer, a, yeah. yeah, say again? It's the inverse of writer in Yeah, in yeah. Of yeah, I, I, was, I was actually checking if I did read correctly, but yeah. ID, it's, it's multi, uh, microservices for IDEs, that's what it is. <laughs> also, uh, for Blazor, uh, we will just, Look out for whatever will pop up. I, I know .NET 6 is definitely on, on the list uh, to, to add dedicated support for. Predictive debugger, I think that um, might even arrive, or at least I know the, the engine behind that is now ready. So we are looking or investigating you, the UX, UI options, etc. We are also looking at the link visualizer so if you're coming from uh, IDEA, for instance, we have a similar view for, for Java data streams. Um, for Entity Framework, and I think in this case it's core, um, we will, we're looking at, the, at some inspections for the N plus one problem. So to make you, uh, make you aware that you might miss some include statements. And also schema validation and even diagrams about uh, about schemas, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, CQRS compliance, so for that, um, that, that actually came from the community. Um, I mean, the issue with, with the request, and we're starting to, to slowly uh, start with a, with a couple of things. Uh, so I think the first thing we want to start with is an inspection that makes sure that one command doesn't, ex uh, doesn't directly call another command. And for .peak, it's support for all the new 
um, for all the new use, uh, C Sharp or, or .NET uh, things, basically, which I think involves native ins, um, async, was it, was it async disposable, um, records, and, and all that stuff. For Rider, the list is a bit longer, even. At least it looks like. Um, but again, here, .NET 6 support and, and C Sharp 10. Also, you know, Windows 11 and Mac OS Monterey, I think it's called. Is that right? They're just at the door, basically. And Mon we'll make Monterey. sure. Monterey. 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 OK. <laughs> yeah. And we will make sure that, that those work smoothly. Um, same as with Apple M1 support. So there is, if, if you don't know yet, uh, there is a build available for that, but it's not, you know, not integrated into, into um, toolbox yet, same as with uh, Rider for, for Unreal. Um, but there is something, and you can check this out and let us know what you think. Um, Code with me also is very high on our priority list, and fingers crossed that we might even see a plugin uh, over the rest of the year. Let's, let's see. Everyone, cross your fingers. Um, a new debugger UI, so that's also in the works for some time, and I think it originates from uh, changes in idea, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, I, I, I already saw it, and it looks cool, definitely, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, multiple startup projects, so this is, you might already know, and I think we even mentioned it, um, you can have compound configurations, which would basically start different projects. But this is also to allow you to run one project and debug the other. So that wasn't available until now, and we're looking forward to, to bring that as well. Problems view is something that, that will arrive with one of the first EAPs, so that it, in, in principle, it's, a, it's also inherited from, from IDEA, but we need to add a few things for it to work in Rider. It's basically just another view for the for stuff like like these uh, errors and solutions view, for instance. So it's like a central view for all different kinds of uh, messages and problems that might be, might be in your solution or that that are present in your solution. For Windows Docker containers, I think that will also arrive in one of the first EAPs. We uh, added debugging. F sharp support. I think I mentioned that already. We're looking for um, for something with curried functions, postfix templates. I don't remember exactly, but we actually will also release the blog post about that. So keep an eye out for that. Um, Maui, as everyone, we will keep an eye on it and and see what needs to be done, and hopefully uh, we also deliver in that in that case. Um, UWP, UWP debugging should also arrive pretty soon. And for Unreal, I think we're looking at uh, improving um, support for Perforce and also uh, running on uh, Linux, on, on Linux as an operating system. And Matt, I think you need to take over Unity because I don't, <laughs> don't remember. Uh, yeah, so, so the other thing with you, uh, Unreal as well is looking towards um, integrating it with the, the release. We need to start releasing it at some point, getting out of preview, uh, whether that's going to be this release or the next release or whatever, um, but we're looking at that. Um, a Unity, um, a couple of um, improvements to the UI toolkit support, so some things with the USS and UXML file types. Uh, we're going to make sure that we show the right syntax highlighting when looking at uh, source code from uh, Unity packages, third-party packages, and uh, also we're going to start processing uh, external packages uh, for for asset usages, which is going to improve the sort of the the existing code uh, vision links we've got to tell you where your code is being used in in other assets, uh, and so on. There, so it sort of makes those links work a whole lot better with uh, extra packages. All right, thanks. And, and definitely, I, I mentioned it already, we will release dedicated blog posts for both of the roadmaps um, where you can actually also read uh, how the confidence is and then uh, for some that are already merged when they arrive, etc. So keep an eye out for that. And with that said, I need to go to the next slide. Uh, for more information, you can visit our blog, uh, you can follow us on Twitter, 
Uh, make sure to follow everyone. Oh, this is, I should have removed this probably. So it's not. We are good. professionals. We are professionals. <laughs> um, Let's just, just hold your hand up at the bottom of the screen. There you are. There you are. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm actually doing it already. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, follow us all, us all on Twitter. If you have any questions, let us know there. Um, we have webinars uh, every once in a while. Check those out and yeah, just 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 check check out on us. Um, and with that said, thanks for joining. Um, I hope you you enjoyed uh, this webinar. Uh, if you did, then let us know by subscribing and and liking that content. No matter on which channel you are, if it's Shepherd's TV or or the Dotnet Foundation. Also, thanks to the Dotnet Foundation for actually hosting us. And yeah, we I guess we will see us uh, in this format uh, another time this year, I hope. And thanks to all my colleagues, Martin, Khalid, Rachel, and, and Matt. And thanks to you uh, for watching. And see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> well done on wearing your hat this long. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm afraid of taking it off. But I will in a moment and you can see what's on the name. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.